Since the turn of the century until 1969, the United Church of Canada managed residential schools for First Nations people on behalf of the federal government. Children were taken from their families, forbidden to speak their native languages, and suffered cultural, physical, spiritual, and emotional abuse. Deep wounds exist to this day for Native people from the experience of cultural genocide. I didn't know why I was being taken away. I didn't know why my grandmother um, felt the need to, to send me away from her. I grew up with my grandparents and my first language was my native language, Titsan language. We try to use our language as much as we can, but every time uh, one of the supervisors heard us, we would say the reporter to our, to our main supervisor, which was the time with Mr. Flint, and then we get beaten severely for that, you know, just for using our language. And I had another close friend who was a pretty good artist, and he had a lot of native art, and it was ripped and torn and then burnt because we weren't allowed to do that. We were numbered as we came in. And we weren't called by names, we were called by our numbers. So if there was punishment, um, well, number 34 would get it, or number one would get it, or whoever. Why I say those, those are my num some of my numbers. Rosalind Ng, a survivor of three residential schools, now works at the University of British Columbia's First Nations House of Learning. The government started the uh, residential schools and of course the church administered the schools. And when you think of it, uh, the, uh, the government and the, uh, the church are really the two foundations of a state. And they were both involved in uh, this whole um, disguise, I guess, of uh, what was really going on um, and uh, the, the treatment of First Nations um, children you know, in these residential schools. Jack Whitty, a United Church layperson, worked in a day school for First Nations children in Manitoba in the 1950s. That all of the church, including the Old Home Missions Board and people, the Women's Missionary Society, all the ones that we dealt with in those days, Everyone felt that what they were doing was in the very best interest of First Nations people. The government um, wanted to force First Nations people to assimilate because I think the bottom line was that they wanted to destroy the culture. And they did this through the, uh, the forbid forbidding children to uh, speak their language. Uh, language is the keystone of culture. And, and so the, uh, the government attacked the language. And um, they did this through uh, the separation of children from their parents in residential schools. I don't remember any toys in the playroom. There was nothing there to stimulate you as a child in, in the school. And there was a lot of crying at night uh, we were in these long dorms. There was a lot of crying at night. The, the kids were lonesome. Supper time, we had a slice of bologna and one scoop of potatoes and a tablespoon of peas or, and um, like another cup of tea. Sundays, we got a fruit. I had big uh, patches on my skin, probably from lack of of nourishment in the foods that we were getting. I started drinking when I was 13. And the reason I drank was uh, to try to erase the memories of what was happening to me until, until I was about 13. How I was uh, raped all the time, uh, sexually abused. And um, when I got into drugs shortly after that. I had this one supervisor 
She said, you were whispering. And I said, no, it was somebody else. And she said, come with me. She says, um, oh, I knew we were going to get it. So we went. And um, she threw, I don't know if it was corn or peas or something on the floor in the shower room. And she said, kneel down. She made us kneel down there till about 2 o'clock in the morning. And um, we knelt down. She'd come there and check on us. And then she told us to get up. And after kneeling so long, we were so sore already anyway on our knees. And um, she gave us a good whipping with a hose, a green hose about this long, about this thick, or like um, a lawn hose, which was cut. And then after that, um, she wasn't satisfied, so she took a brush and beat us with it. And um, she still wasn't satisfied because we learned not to cry. No matter how much pain we went through and endured, we were taught not to cry. So we wouldn't cry. It didn't matter whether Christians, uh, you know, um, um, believed in, in um, love and, and treating people uh, with care and respect. If they looked at another person as subhuman, then it justified their mistreatment of them. And so I think in some ways that uh, this could account for a lot of the, uh, the cruelty that occurred uh, to the children at these residential schools. I know that in the light of history and, and with hindsight, we look back now and, and we find a whole series of things that are wrong about residential schools. And, and I don't just mean here the abuse of things that happened. You know, I recognize that there were, there were abuses, obviously. They're, they're, they're well documented. Looking back now, it's probably fair to say that the most difficult or maybe the, the, the most negative thing residential schools did was break up families. The consequences uh, on parenting skills for First Nations people who attended uh, residential schools was the loss of parenting skills. Um, the experience of growing up in a family prepares you for parenthood. And really, it's, it's the only thing. Um, there's no schools that teach you that. And, and so um, for people who went to these residential schools, they're, um, they learned to imitate the, uh, the behavior of uh, their caregiver. The abused, uh, I have heard, have been abusers themselves. There's a lot of alcoholism. Through all my drinking and my drugging, I was, uh, I turned to uh, a violent, a violent man. Um, I didn't like anything or anyone telling me what to do. And, um, I was taking my anger out from what happened to me in residential school and everybody else that I knew. There was never a God in my life. Because how could there be a God when things like that could happen? They could never give me back knowing a home or having my brothers and sisters, knowing how it is to have a real family. To me, what really, what's really important in the healing is spirituality. I had lots of that before I went to residential school. And I'm getting most of that back now. As part of the church's response to the legacy of the residential school experience, the August 1994 meeting of the General Council established a healing fund to assist First Nations communities in dealing with the hurt. At the 1986 General Council, the United Church apologized to Native congregations for injustices inflicted on them by the church for centuries. Repentance and reconciliation involve actions as well as words. The Healing Fund has a goal, to raise $1 million through voluntary contributions from church members and others who wish to contribute. 
It is also intended to broaden the understanding of non-native United Church people about the ongoing impact of the schools. Healing is um, talking about the issues that that you had to go through and um, just keep talking about it over and over with somebody and verifying that it didn't happen and uh, making other people understand that these things really did happen in residential school. It's not something that we just talk about just to get attention or something, but that's that these are really, truly painful memories that we have to live with. The kind of uh, spiritual healing that the church does when we're at our best, when we really do tell people that no matter where you've been and what you've, what you've been through, God is still on your side. Money will be distributed to First Nations communities according to criteria established by the Healing Fund Council. The Healing Fund Council is composed of First Nations representatives from the All Native Circle Conference and the British Columbia Division of Native Ministries. Projects receiving support will be initiated, based and supported by Native communities. Would an apology be enough? Would a, an apology be enough to you if you had your children taken away from you? And I know many uh, European Canadian uh, people who are mothers and fathers, and I know that they would never put up with having their children uh, removed from them. So if they did that to you, would an apology be acceptable? I don't think so. In 1986, when I was moderator of the General Council of the United Church, I offered an apology to the native people of our church for the wrongs which we had done them over the years. And that apology was acknowledged at a ceremony two years later at the next General Council. In the intervening years, my greatest fear has been that the apology would remain simply words. The stories of which you have had hints in this presentation tell us that words are not enough. Margaret Atwood has written that the facts of the world seen clearly are seen through tears. Why ask me then what is wrong with my eyes? What I hear when I listen to these stories is the sound of tears. And the Healing Fund, I believe, provides us with a way of responding to those tears and of indicating clearly to our sisters and brothers that we mean what we say when we say we are sorry. Mm -hmm.